Good morning. My name is Joey Morrison, and I'm one of the pastors at Southside Baptist Church. So welcome everyone who is joining us uh, for this video this of, of, the, of our, I guess, virtual <laughs> sermon, in a sense. Uh, this in no way is to replace what we normally do, our gathering here on Sunday mornings, but unfortunately, due to uh, our current circumstances uh, here and around the world, we are ha having to do this. We're thankful for technology, uh, but uh, as always, we miss gathering and seeing each other's faces. So thank you for those who are, who are tuning in, uh, who are not part of our church. We hope you'll be blessed, and uh, also check out our Facebook and uh, website for further information. Uh, if you want to contact us afterwards, uh, the information is there for you to do so. So again, thank you for being uh, with us. And so with that, I'm going to ask uh, our brother, Dale De La Cruz, to come and lead us in prayer. Let us pray. O oh, gracious God and King, we give you praise and honor this morning. We thank you for the opportunity you have given us this day to remind ourselves of your steadfast love. For it is right to acknowledge you as the sovereign Lord of the universe. It is of you and through you and for you that all things move and breathe and have their being. That all things hold together by the might of your sovereign will. You are not silent. You are a very present help in times of trouble for those who seek you, all to the glory of your name forever and ever. Forgive us, my God, when we have allowed despair to overwhelm us and forget the salvation we have in you. Forgive us when we read and hear the reports of the amount of people affected by this virus and the numbers of those who have fallen to this disease as we see the uncertainty of many in our society through the lens of the empty shelves in the grocery stores and allow that to further fuel our anxiety and overshadow our hope in you in these very difficult times. Forgive us. We need to be reminded that we who have been bought by the blood of Christ have our greatest need already met. The darkness that existed in our hearts was illuminated by the light of the gospel. The enmity between the sinner and a holy God was reconciled at the cross of Jesus Christ. Remind us that our greatest seed is not found in our family and friends, in any personal or professional success we may have, or by how much material wealth we can accumulate. No. Our greatest need is to have the peace of knowing that we no longer have to remind ourselves of the guilt and shame, that we no longer have to carry the burden around. At the cross, Christ took our sins upon himself and gave to those who believe in him by faith his righteousness. Forever remembering our guilt and our shame no more. Remind us that we have, that we can now live our life with joy and peace, not beholden to any happiness which we, have, we may find in this world. Remind us of the freedom we have to share that gospel of peace to a world desperately seeking it. Remind us that it is the light of the gospel that shines within us that the world will see. And all those separated physically, we remind us that those of us who are in Christ are united by one spirit, by one faith, and by one body. So help us to reach out to those in our body and those in our community who need that word of encouragement, as well as any other needs that they may have. We also pray for our elected leaders and the health professionals dealing with this pandemic for strength to make wise decisions to reduce or eliminate the spread of this contagion as we biblically submit to their leadership. We also pray for our doctors and nurses and first responders, our police and our fire department and emergency 
uh, medical technicians who are at the front lines, giving, um, give them strength to care for patients and protect them and their family. So thank you, Lord, for giving us this day to remind ourselves of who you really are, our sovereign Lord and God, who is in control of all things and nothing slips by your hand. Let us find the peace to know that you are in control and that our love shine, Lord, um, through those who we come in contact with. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you for that, Dale. For those watching, if you would turn in your Bibles now to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. <clears throat> and I'll be reading verses 1 through 12. Mark chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately... Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were, that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven, or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw anything like this. Carl Menninger, the famous psychiatrist of the 1900s, said that if he could convince the patients in his psychiatric hospitals that their sins are forgiven, 75% of them could walk out the next day. Forgiveness. It is defined as the excusing of an offense without exacting a penalty. It is a beautiful thing to behold when put into practice. But despite Dr. Menninger's view of its helpfulness and importance, I'm not so sure forgiveness is a popular concept today, at least in its true definition. It requires the one who offended to admit that they did something wrong, which most people don't like to do. And then it requires the one offended, the victim, to absorb a loss without getting their justice. But despite our society's struggle with it, the Bible would teach that forgiveness is a fundamental need, not just for a, from, a, from a therapeutic standpoint, like, like Dr. Menninger suggests, or even a relational standpoint that perhaps some, some of us are dealing with right now in our own lives. But we need it most from an eternal standpoint with God. And today's passage speaks to this. The last passage ended with Jesus going to different towns in Galilee, preaching the gospel and healing many, and his fame is spreading. And so from the wording of verse 1 of chapter 2, it appears that Jesus has, gone, uh, has been gone a while, but has now returned to Capernaum, which seems to be his home base, probably at the home of Peter and Andrew, his disciples, which seem, 
Oh, I'm sorry. And, it, and, it, and, he's not, and he's not there long before people find out and a crowd begins to gather again until it's packed inside. And then we have this account of four men carrying what we would assume to be a friend of theirs who was paralyzed. They bring him to Jesus, carrying him on his bed, not a full bed frame or anything like that, but something very basic for that time. And they are, and they are so desperate to help their friend that they go to extreme measures to give their friend access to Jesus. They climb up on the roof of the home. Back in those days, there was typically a stairway on the outside of a home. The roof itself was flat for people to, to work and rest on. It was framed with wood beams and covered in mud. So these four men went up on the roof and dug a hole in the roof and lowered their friend down to Jesus. It's really a dramatic story. And we haven't even mentioned the most dramatic part yet which starts with Jesus' reply to this paralytic. Instead of just healing the man, he declares his sins to be forgiven. And that is what we want to focus our attention on. And, and the question, why did Jesus bring up the forgiveness of his sins, this, this paralytic's sins? The paralytic's friends brought him to be healed and made to walk. That, that appears to be their hope, what they anticipated. So why the forgiveness of sins? And I see three reasons here. Number one, to show we need it more than anything else. Secondly, to show Jesus can provide it. And thirdly, to show we can believe in it. And those are the three points we want to look at in the text. So... Our, our first point, we need it, really zeroes in on verse 5. We've already discussed the, the first four verses, which introduces everything, but verse 5 is where the plot begins to thicken with Jesus declaring that this paralytic sins are forgiven. And again, the obvious question is, why did he go there? Why even bring it up? The man's got some serious needs. There's no disability check uh, in, in those days that, that, that came each month. A person in, in this condition was left either uh, to, to begging on the streets or depending on their family to take care of them. And it is widely known now what Jesus is capable of doing here. If Jesus could heal this man, it would change everything for this guy. So why does Jesus go there? Why, does he, why, does, why doesn't he just do like he did for the leper and immediately touch him and heal him? Because he wants to make clear what he really needs most, even more than the ability to walk. You see, walking is temporary. God's forgiveness is forever. And that is everybody's greatest need. I'm sure everyone, most everyone watching this doesn't have an issue with walking, but I am confident we are all starting to understand the seriousness of our situation involving the coronavirus. We've seen nothing like this, at least in our lifetimes. Uh, so we can all agree that we need a cure so lives can be saved. We need that curve that, they've, that they're talking about to flatten out so life can begin to go back to normal. This, this need dominates not only our individual lives, but literally the whole world. Nothing brought this seriousness, this, the seriousness of all this home to me more than seeing the, the new refrigeration units at our own local hospital here, Atrium, pictured in the newspaper this past week to be used as a makeshift morgue in case of a serious rise in deaths due to to the virus. Now, this is not to scare anyone, but we need to take this very seriously. Yet, having said that, folks, it is not as serious as our greatest need, our need for the forgiveness of our sins. The reason for this need is that the word Jesus was teaching uh, back, as mentioned in verse 2, tells us that we have all sinned against God. Sin is defined as rebellion against God. 
seeking an, an independence from God, to, to not depend on Him or submit to His leadership. Sin is not, is not good when it is done against anybody, yet to sin against the great God of the universe, who we owe everything to, puts the seriousness and the debt of our sin on another level. The just punishment is horrible and forever. And so that is the future for everyone who does not find forgiveness from God. And so you see, it puts the need for forgiveness from God on a whole different level than, say, being paralyzed or infected by the coronavirus. And and I don't say that lightly, folks. There, There is a very good chance someone we know will die from this. It is possible that family members or or church members could die. But in the grand scheme of things, it is still temporal. Life isn't forever, but God's judgment is. Jesus himself describes God's judgment in, in Mark 9, verse 48, as a place where, quote, their worm does not die in the fire is not quenched. I don't know if Jesus is referring to a literal fire or not, but regardless, it will be awful and it will be forever. We all need to know we are forgiven by God. Everything else fails in comparison. And so that brings us then to the second reason Jesus declares to the paralytic that his sins are forgiven. And that is to show that he can provide that forgiveness. In verses 6 through 8, we get into really the heart of the text. Jesus has been compared to the scribes in chapter 1, but here for the first time, Mark uh, has them interacting. Obviously at this point, there doesn't seem to be any sign of animosity, which will be the theme as we go further into to Mark. They are, they are actually at Jesus' home, or at least where he's staying at this time. But then in verses 6 and 7, after Jesus has pronounced his forgiveness of the paralytic, it says the scribes were questioning Jesus' words in their hearts. They are rightly thinking that only God can forgive sin. And not understanding Jesus to be divine, they see that he is, what, they see what he is saying is wrong, even, even blasphemy. And that he doesn't have that kind of authority, the authority to forgive. And so the thing you have to remember, though, is that everything in verse 7 is just in their thinking. They aren't telling Jesus these things. They're, They're not openly defying him yet. So in the next two verses, we actually have Jesus supernaturally reading their hearts and minds. Ironically, they don't think he has the authority, yet he is reading their minds. He knows their thoughts. And so Jesus confronts them on their secret thoughts. He is actually the antagonist and the aggressor here. And he asks them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Here is some amazing drama, folks. Jesus could have kept what he knew quiet, but he wants to expose here their unbelief and challenge it. He's getting ready to challenge them on their worldview, their, their way of thinking was something undeniable. And of course, God does this to people all the time. People can be entrenched in their views, and God confronts them with undeniable truth, and they are faced with a big decision to dig their heels in more or acknowledge and embrace the truth. But it's only by the grace of God that people are able to stop resisting and admit the truth. Perhaps that could be describing you today, watching this. Perhaps you are entrenched in ways, and God is using this message to challenge you, to to open you up, to awaken you to his truth. We trust in God's grace to help you. And so, and so Jesus asked the scribes, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk? Obviously, to be able to do either would require an act of God. So then we come to the climax, the climax of a story 
is when something happens in the story where there's no going back. Okay, there's been this buildup, and, and, and here we are at the climax. And so Jesus says in verse 10, But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He obviously then turns to paralytic and says, I say, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And then it says in verse 12, he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all. So the point of all that, folks, is to show that Jesus does have the authority to forgive sins. That is what he, has come, he had come to do, to provide the forgiveness of sins to all who would believe in him. Of course, the irony of Jesus' question about which is easier is that in a very real sense, it was much harder to be able to forgive sins. He just speaks and this man is healed of his paralysis. But this scene here is the beginning of the conflict with the scribes and other religious leaders that will lead to Jesus being arrested, convicted of blasphemy, as the scribes here were, were thinking, and ultimately crucified. But it is his death that covers sin and provides the forgiveness that we all need. As we talked about last week, Jesus died as a substitute for sinners. His death covers sin. His death satisfies God's wrath and the demand for justice for sinning against a holy God. Christ's death then allows God to forgive. The Bible is quite clear on this. Jesus is the only way by which man can be saved. Without his death, a person is left responsible for his own sin and the judgment that comes with it. But in Christ, he covered our sin. He took the judgment. He satisfied the justice. Our sins, past, present, and future, are covered in Christ. And so that leaves us with the final point, folks. We can believe it. We can believe it. The passage concludes with the celebration. The crowd who saw this drama unfold are left in amazement praising God and simply confessing that they had never seen anything like this. And so having witnessed this now, it should have encouraged them and it should encourage us all to believe it, to put our faith in Christ. If you, if you think about it, that's how all this started. All this started with four guys having heard or perhaps witnessed other healings by Jesus that caused them to bring their, their friend, believing that Jesus could heal him. It was their knowledge of what Jesus could do for their friend that led them to go to such drastic measures. I, I would encourage anyone to dig a hole in someone's roof if, if, they, if they are denied access. But the point was to show the magnitude of what Jesus has to offer. They had to get him in there. And, and then... It, and then the willingness that Jesus has to give to all who ask. But not even these men, nor the paralytic, knew what Jesus really could offer them. Far better than making a man walk, he can make a man free. Free from the bondage of sin. Free from the guilt and shame of sin. Free from the fear of death and judgment. Free from the cares and concerns of this world. To know that we have been completely loved and forgiven by God is far better than anything this world has to offer. Far better than anything we might be afraid of losing. In Christ is the only place true security and peace can be found. It is the only thing that we cannot lose. As Paul tells us in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So this passage teaches us that, that we come by faith as these men came to Jesus. Faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. Suffering and dying in our place to pay for our sins. And then rising on the third day to prove he had accomplished it for us. As Ephesians 2.8 tells us, that it is by grace, through faith alone, that we are forgiven and saved. So again, there's someone here, not part of our church, watching this video today. And you know you are without Christ. Come to Him. Believe on Him. As those four men brought that paralytic. And He is so willing to receive you and accept you. Come to Him by faith. And then contact us through the website and the Facebook page. Call us and let us help you further in following Christ. Now, of course, let me add, implied in being forgiven of sin would be that we turn from those sins that God has forgiven us of. We call this repentance. We understand this, we understand this with any relationship we have. This isn't hard for us to understand. If, if we have done something to hurt someone or harm our relationship with them, then, then implied in seeking forgiveness and reconciliation is that we will seek not to do those wrong actions that hurt the relationship, that hurt that other person. So it is with God. But it's, it's not to earn anything. And, and God knows we will never be perfect. But a true relationship with God will include a true love for God and a desire to walk in His ways. One of those ways is that we will forgive as He has forgiven us. We will not hold grudges. For those who do us wrong, we will desire to forgive if they seek it. And even for those who don't seek it, we will trust them in God's hands and pray for them, desiring reconciliation. And if we do someone, if we do someone wrong ourselves, we will, we will go to them and ask for forgiveness and make restitution if we are able. We will also be a compassionate and generous people as God has been compassionate and generous to us, giving the, the ultimate sacrifice anyone could give in the cross. We will do the same for others. The times we live in require much sacrifice for others. Part of that is, of course, adhering to the social distancing that the government has asked of us. For example, this past week, my wife and I wanted to go see our granddaughters, but decided it was best to, to wait and hold off for, for now. And that was very painful, but necessary in our love for them. Perhaps not hoarding as some are apt to do out of fear, but getting what we need for the time so there is plenty for others to have. And, and doing all we can through perhaps the phone or social media to check on folks and encourage. And of course, like these four men, do all we can to help our, our loved ones, our friends, Come to know Jesus. These are all the kinds of things that flow from a life that has been forgiven by God. The flow from a heart that knows the assurance of that love that the cross has proven. And with that, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. We praise you. And rejoice as those, as those folks, when they, when they saw uh, the Lord heal that paralytic, and how they rejoiced at what they had seen. They were amazed and praised you. Father, we do so now as we reflect on the cross, our ultimate healing. As Christ gave his life so that our wounds could be healed, our sin. We thank you. We know that in Christ... We are forgiven completely, absolutely. 
We cannot be separated from that love. And so, Father, we trust and we acknowledge that we, we often uh, are distracted and lose sight of that love. And so, Lord, we, we ask that you will renew us this day and, and continually daily, Lord, uh, draw us to your word to remind ourselves of your promises to us and to be able to, to, to call out to you, cry out to you in, in, in our prayers for all of our needs and trust in you to, to meet our needs and, and, and just to be, to be reminded in those times with you of your great love for us in Christ. And Father, that through being reminded of that, we'll be able to live each day, uh, to live out that love in this world uh, as, we, as we love those around us. Empower us as a church to do that. Empower us as believers to do that, Father. And Lord, um, that we would be able to forgive others um, when, they, uh, when, they, uh, when they sin against us, that we would truly live out the gospel in our lives. And Father, for those who don't know your forgiveness, who uh, have listened to this um, message today or watch this message today and, and uh, are outside of Christ, Father, that you would draw them to today. Lord, that you, would, that you would give them eyes to see that, that you are the greatest treasure, that you are, you are greater than all your gifts to us, that you are ultimately the treasure and that we are to seek and, and, that, and it is a treasure through Christ that we can never lose. Help folks to see that. Help folks to, put, to see their, their need for forgiveness, to be able to see their sin for what it is, and, um, and that they will never measure up, uh, and, and to put their faith in, in, the, in your mercy, in your grace in Christ. Father, thank you. Thank you for, for Jesus. Thank you for the sacrifice for us. And we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.